The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Nana Adodankwa Ekufuadu, President of the Republic of Ghana. I request protocol to escort His Excellency and invite him to address the Assembly. Madam President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot help but reflect on the significance of this moment, as this will be my final opportunity to address the United Nations General Assembly as I enter the closing months of my presidency. Over the past eight years, I've had the privilege of speaking on several variations of the essential themes that quite properly dominate the deliberations of this global assembly, the condition of humanity and the state of the planet. Serving the people of Ghana and by extension those of West Africa, Africa and the world has truly been the greatest blessing of my life. Indeed, being here this morning fills me with both pride and humility. Pride in the limited progress we have made together as nations and humility in recognizing the challenges that still remain. My time as president has been deeply fulfilling and I'm profoundly grateful for the trust placed in me by my fellow Ghanaians. It has been an honor to serve them and to contribute to advancing peace, security, and development on the global stage. So president, Madam President, I'm here with a heart full of hope yet mindful of the great challenges that still confront us. As President of the Republic of Ghana and as a citizen of the world, I'm acutely aware of the shared responsibility we carry. Our work here is nothing less than shaping the future of humanity, a future that will affect generations long after we are gone. Leaving no one behind, acting together for the advancement of peace sustainable development and human dignity for present and future generations reminds us that the decisions we take here will define whether we rise to meet the hopes of billions or continue to let inequalities and injustice persist. We owe it to those who look to this body for leadership to act and not just to talk. The world we live in today is a stark, unfortunate contrast of privilege and hardship. For too long, the voices of those marginalized, those left behind, have been drowned out. They constitute the bulk of humanity. These are the voices of the poor, the displaced, the vulnerable. We cannot, in good conscience, leave them behind. They should be at the center of our discussions and our decisions. Africa in particular knows the cost of being left out. Yes, we are a continent rich in potential and resilient in the face of adversity, but we have also been disadvantaged by a global system that has generally treated us as an afterthought. We have been viewed merely as passive recipients of aid rather than as equal partners in global progress. The well-meaning promises of assistance have failed to materialize to bring about the long-term change we so passionately need. Such aid as is offered often comes with strings attached, limiting our ability to shape our own futures. Africa is not a continent of despair. She is full of great possibilities. She is required, however, to chart a new course of development. Our, voting, our young population is filled with energy, creativity, and ambition. The people of Africa are not asking for handouts. They're demanding opportunities in a new global architecture so they can have access to education, health care, and jobs to be able to build better lives for themselves, their families, and their descendants. In Ghana, we've taken bold and decisive steps to ensure that no one is left behind in our national development, and we have shown that it is possible. Our flagship free senior high school policy 
has benefited 5.7 million young people, many of whom would have been denied the opportunity to learn, to dream, and to succeed. This initiative has transformed the lives of millions, positioning the next generation of Ghanaians to take their place as leaders in the global economy. But this is just the beginning. We need a global commitment to ensure that every child, no matter where they are born, has access to quality education. A world where children are left unprepared for the challenges ahead is not a just world. Beyond education, we have also prioritized health care for our people. Through Agenda 111, my government has embarked on the largest ever health care infrastructure project in Ghana's history. This initiative is constructing 111 hospitals across the country, ensuring that even the most remote regions have access to modern health care facilities. This is part of our broader goal of ensuring that no one is in Ghana is left without the basic right to health. We've also taken significant steps to boost food security and economic growth through the program for planting for food and jobs. This initiative has improved food production, created jobs and enhanced incomes for millions of Ghanaians. It is a clear demonstration that with the right policies and investments, we can transform our agricultural sector and ensure that no one goes hungry. In the same vein, our one district, one factory policy is transforming the industrial landscape of the nation, generating the structural transformation of our economy which is our major strategic objective. And in addition, Ghana has embraced in full the teachers of the fourth industrial revolution and is actively pursuing an agenda of digitalization. Under my administration, we have revolutionized public service delivery by integrating technology into governance. From the introduction of the Ghana card, which has streamlined our identification and access to services, to the digitalization of the country's land registry. These reforms have enhanced transparency, efficiency, and accountability. Digitalization has improved the lives of ordinary Ghanaians and has also laid the groundwork for sustainable economic growth in the digital age. And let us not forget the strides we have made in enhancing the rule of law and governance through reforms in the judicial system strengthening our democratic institutions and promoting transparency, Ghana continues to be a beacon of good governance in Africa. We have enacted laws and implemented policies that uphold the principles of accountability and ensure that every Ghanaian, regardless of their background, is protected by the rule of law. Madam President, it is impossible to address the challenges of today without speaking of the contradictions that exist within this global institution. We gather here to discuss peace, but wars continue to ravage nations. We speak of justice, yet justice endures. Take the Russian invasion of Ukraine, for instance. Millions of lives have been uprooted. Thousands have lost their lives, and yet the Security Council has struggled to respond decisively, just as it is struggling to make a decisive intervention in the tragic ongoing war in Gaza and the Lebanon. The structure of the Council reflects a world that no longer exists, and its failure to act in times of crisis raises a difficult question. What is the purpose of the Security Council if it cannot intervene when the world needs it most? Reforming the UN Security Council is a matter of fairness and necessity. The current structure created in 1945 no longer reflects the realities of today's geopolitical and economic landscape. Africa, Latin America, and South Asia remain underrepresented despite their significant influence on global affairs. This lack of representation undermines the legitimacy of the Council's decisions and the use of veto power by a few permanent members often paralyzes its ability to act effectively during crises. Reform is essential to ensure that the Council is more inclusive, democratic, and responsive to the complex challenges we face today. 
The world has changed, and the Security Council must change with it to maintain its relevance in promoting global peace and security. For years, I've championed the need to reform the Security Council as per the Ezzawini Consensus, the Common African Position on UN Reform, which calls for Africa to have permanent seats on the Council. It is incomprehensible that a continent of 1.4 billion people has no permanent voice in shaping decisions that affect global peace and security. The time for half measures is over. We need a Security Council that is fit for purpose in today's world. It is heartening, however, that finally the demand for reform has found acceptance by leaders of two of the five permanent members, President Joe Biden of the United States of America and President Emmanuel Macron of France. Hopefully, the others will soon follow suit. We must also recognize that the fight for peace goes beyond government actions. It is a fight for humanity itself. In Africa, we have often borne the brunt of conflicts, sending our troops to peacekeeping missions with limited support from the global community. While I'm pleased to see the UN now taking steps to finance peacekeeping in Africa, an outcome of Ghana's presidency of the UN Security Council, we must go further. Peacekeeping alone is not enough. We must address the potential causes of conflict, poverty, inequality, and lack of opportunity. True peace comes from investing in education, healthcare, and economic development. However, peace cannot be imposed from the outside. It must be built from within. African nations must take ownership of their security, and the African Union needs to strengthen itself to be able to respond swiftly to, its, to threats. Madam President, as I speak today, Ongoing developments in West Africa are deeply troubling. Military coups in Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Niger threaten the democratic process, progress we have worked so hard to achieve within the ECOMAS community. These coups are stark reminders that democracy is indeed fragile and must be continually nurtured. In Ghana, however, we will remain resolute in our commitment to democracy. As my presidency draws to a close, I want to assure this assembly that the upcoming 2024 elections in Ghana will be free, fair, and transparent. Ghanaians have demonstrated time and again in the last three decades their strong attachment to democracy, which they will not permit to be undermined. The Electoral Commission, supported by Ghana's security services, is well equipped to ensure that the will of the Ghanaian people is respected. Ghana has long been a, a beacon of democracy in Africa, and we intend to keep it that way. The 2024 elections will be proof of our enduring adherence to the rule of law, transparency, and the principles of democratic accountability that have guided our nation in recent decades. As President, we find, Madam President, we find ourselves at a pivotal moment in history. The decisions we make today will shape the future of our world. We can choose to act with courage, compassion, and a commitment to leave no one behind. Or we can choose inaction and allow the suffering of millions and the degradation of the planet to continue. Let me end by reminding us all that the future is not something that simply happens. It is something we create. We have the power in this room to change the course of history. Let us not shy away from that responsibility. Let us act now and let us act together. I wish you God's blessings in all your current and future deliberations. And I thank you for your attention. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Ghana. I wish to thank the President of the Czech Republic. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine. I request protocol to escort His Excellency and invite him to address the Assembly.
Thank you very much, dear leaders, your excellencies. Today I want to tell you about a day that has already passed and a day that must never come. On the night of March 4th, 2022, I received one of the most terrifying reports since the beginning of a full-scale Russian invasion against Ukraine. The report was about Russian tanks firing directly at the buildings of our Ukrainian nuclear power plant, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest one in Europe, six nuclear reactors. The Russian army stormed this facility just as brutally as any other during this war, without thinking about the consequences, possibly disastrous. This was one of the most horrifying moments of the war, when no one could know how Russian strikes on the nuclear facility would end, and everyone in Ukraine was reminded of what Chernobyl means. Now, the Dabarizhia nuclear power plant remains occupied by Russian forces, unfortunately, and it's at risk of a nuclear incident. This is the major source of radiation danger in Europe, possibly in the world. That's why in the peace formula I presented the first point is about nuclear safety. In Ukraine, we know exactly what we are dealing with. And I want to thank you, the General Assembly members, for adopting a resolution in July this year on the safety of nuclear facilities in Ukraine. Most in the world understand what's at stake. The General Assembly demanded that Russian return control of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant to Ukraine. Only then real nuclear security will return to Europe and the world. And now about the day that must never come. Since Russia can't defeat our people's resistance on the battlefield, Putin is looking for other ways to break the Ukrainian spirit. One of his methods is targeting our energy infrastructure. And these are deliberate Russian attacks on our power plants and the entire energy grid. As of today, Russia has destroyed all our thermal power plants and a large part of our hydroelectric capacity. This is how Putin is preparing for winter, hoping to torment millions, millions of Ukrainians, ordinary families, women, children, ordinary towns, ordinary villages. Putin wants to leave them in the dark and cold this winter, forcing Ukraine to suffer and surrender. Just imagine, please, your country with 80% of its energy system gone, with such a destroyed part of the system. What kind of life would that be? Recently, I received yet another alarming report from our intelligence. Now Putin does seem to be planning attacks on our nuclear power plants and their infrastructure, aiming to disconnect the plants from the power grid. With the help of satellites, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, satellites of other countries, Russia is getting images and detailed information about the infrastructure of our nuclear power plants. But what does this really threaten? Any missile or drone strike, any critical incident in the energy system could lead to a nuclear disaster. A day like that must never come. And Moscow needs to understand this, and this depends in part on your determination to put pressure on the aggressor. These are nuclear power plants. They must be safe. Ladies and gentlemen, two years ago in the fall of 2022, I proposed a comprehensive strategy to end the war and to ensure security. And I presented the peace formula at a highly inclusive political platform for world leaders, the G20 summit in Indonesia representing billions of citizens from all parts 
of the globe. And it's important for us that all these people can understand us, understand that Ukraine wants to end this war more than anyone in the world. War always poses a threat to many. You all see in the media and read in reports what is happening in Ukraine because of Russia's war. It's something many are imagining happening to themselves. And yes, the smoke from fires in war-torn cities can reach other countries. And if, God forbid, Russia causes a nuclear disaster at one, at one of our nuclear power plants, radiation will not respect state borders. And unfortunately, various nations could feel the devastating effects. Many are concerned, but the deepest understanding of war is always found in the home it destroys. It's the Ukrainian people who feel the full pain of this war. It's Ukrainian children who are learning to distinguish the sounds of different types of artillery and drones because of Russia's war. It's our people who are forcefully separated by occupation because Putin decided he could do whatever he wants. It's our heroic soldiers who are giving their lives to defend our country from invaders trying to steal our land. That's why we say, rightfully so, there can be no just peace without Ukraine. And I think every leader, every country that supports us in this, that understands us, that sees how Russia, a country more than 20 times larger than Ukraine in territory, still wants even more land, more land, which is insane, and is seizing it day by day while wanting to destroy its neighbor. And Russia found very special bodies for that, North Korea and Iran, telling choice of friends. And now every neighbor of Russia in Europe and Central Asia feels that the war could come to them as well and just think what kind of losses that would mean for the world. And I think nearly 100 nations and international organizations that have supported the peace formula. It's truly a global community, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, North America, the Pacific region, all united by the peace formula. And I am glad that the first peace summit was so reminding of the UN General Assembly. Everyone was equal, all nations that participated in the peace summit, large and small, no veto right, no blocking authority, those that have been independent for ages and those that have only recently gained independence, those that have gone through wars themselves and those accustomed to peace, all, all were equal. That is what Russia hates the most and cannot control. That's why Russia says the peace formula doesn't suit it. Here at the UN, I've already met with leaders from India, Guatemala, Japan and Italy, Turkey and Finland, Canada, Paraguay, Slovenia, Germany and others, and, and my meetings will continue. These are different, absolutely, parts of the world and various political waves of life, but they share the same understanding. Peace is needed and it must be a real, just peace. Unfortunately, at the UN, it's impossible to truly and fairly resolve matters of war and peace because too much, too much depends in the Security Council on the veto power. When the aggressor exercises veto power, the UN is powerless to stop the war, but the peace formula can. Once again, there is no veto power in it. That's why it's the best opportunity for peace. Everyone is equal and it's effective and comprehensive. When some propose alternatives, 
half-hearted settlement plans, so-called sets of principles. It not only ignores the interests and suffering of Ukrainians, who are affected by the war the most, it not only ignores reality, but also gives Putin the political space to continue the war and pressure the world to bring more nations under control. Any parallel or alternative attempts to seek peace are, in fact, efforts to achieve a law instead of an end to the war as a global initiative. The peace formula has already existed for two years, and maybe somebody wants a Nobel Prize for their political biography for frozen truths instead of real peace, but the only prizes Putin will give you in return are more suffering and disasters. We must restore nuclear safety. Energy must stop being used as a weapon. We must ensure food security. We need to bring home all our captured soldiers and civilians possibly deported to Russia. We must uphold the UN Charter and guarantee our right, Ukraine's right to territorial integrity and sovereignty, just as we do for any other nation. We need to withdraw the Russian occupiers, which will bring an end to the hostilities in Ukraine. And we must hold those responsible for war crimes accountable. We need to prevent ecocide and stop the destruction of nature caused by the war. And we must not allow a second or a sword phase of this Russian invasion. And we need to make it clear the war is over. This is the peace formula. What part of this could be unacceptable to anyone who upholds the UN Charter? If someone in the world seeks alternatives to any of these points or tries to ignore any of them, it likely means they themselves want to do a part of what Putin is doing. The point they ignore reveals the desire they are hiding. And when the Chinese-Brazilian duo tries to grow into a choir of voices with someone in Europe with someone in Africa saying something alternative to a full and just peace, the question arises, what is the true interest? Everyone must understand, you will not boost your power at Ukraine's expense. And the world has already been through colonial wars and conspiracies of great powers and the expense of those who are small and Every country, including China, Brazil, European nations, African nations, Middle East, all understand why this must remain in the past. And Ukrainians will never accept, will never accept why anyone in the world believes that such a brutal colonial past, which suits no one today, can be imposed on Ukraine now instead of a normal peaceful life. I want peace for my people, real peace and just peace. And I'm asking for your support from all nations of the world. We do not divide the world. I ask the same of you. Do not divide the world. Be united nations. And that will bring us peace. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of Ukraine.